Hello, welcome back to another adventure with Snap Revise. Uh, it's Hello, been a little, ooh, welcome back. Apparently I left my laptop on loud, that's embarrassing. Um, it's been a little while since I've done one of these little sessions, so hopefully you guys are still feeling really engaged and you're still really excited about biology and everything hasn't gone terribly just yet, fingers crossed, say. Eh? Um, I'll get started because I've got a lot to tell you about today um, in terms of Snap Revise 2.0 finally being up and running so you can start to properly enjoy all of the things that we have to offer you. Um, hopefully you guys can see my screen if I've got it in the right place. Ooh, I shouldn't have it there, though. Um, so let's get going. Um, today, what we're going to be looking at then is we are going to be looking at um, the test for carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. So lots of people were mentioning this uh, earlier on and I never I really got around to talking about it properly. So today's going to be the first time I talk about these and hopefully you're, you're going to feel like you've got a good idea of what I'm on about. Um, well done to the person who got here 37 minutes early. That is impressive. I don't quite know how someone got there this quickly, but kudos. Um, equally, I'm enjoying seeing all you guys saying what exam boards you're doing. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you do. I'm going to try and cover a bit of everything today. So everything that is in your exam board, I should be covering at some point. OK, um, just a little bit of information about me. Those of you that haven't watched these before. Um, Basically, my name is Ollie, as I'm sure some of you know. I think some of my old students might have found some of these videos, and if they have, that might be weird for you to see me called Ollie. My name is called Ollie. Um, I'm head of biology here at Snap Proviso. Uh, I've got a bachelor's degree. I like when I'm having to look at this to remember what I've got. I've got a bachelor's degree in biology, so I studied that for a few years, and I've been a teacher of A-level biology for the last four years. So hopefully I know what I'm talking about more than most people. Hopefully I'll be able to help you out with quite a few of these things. Um, Again, as well, just so you know what this is sort of going to be about, uh, these web classes are supposed to be a way for you guys to be recapping the stuff that you have done. Okay, hopefully you've covered this a little bit in school. Uh, I would have thought so by now coming up to half term. Um, but I'm going to be looking at the key points. I'm going to look at some exam technique and we're going to, well, you guys can ask some questions if you want to. I'll put some nice little question marks to look at that. You can ask questions along the way. I'll have a go at answering them. Um, and then hopefully we'll go away knowing a little bit more than what we did. Um, excellent. Yes, delete your spot on. Everyone does need to know these tests. So just to talk about what I'm going to tell you at the end of this session. So we have a free account for one person. So one person on this, uh, we're watching right now, will get Snap Provise 2.0. You'll get a really good package from us, the ultimate package. Uh, one of you will get that at the end of today's session. I think it might be announced tomorrow. I need to find out. Um, there will also be a code for all of you that you can all use so you can get a big 40% discount on our uh, different services. So stay tuned till the end and hopefully you guys will be able to use one of those things. Um, right, so to get started then, let's see what you guys already know. So this is my little pyramid of success that I possibly stole from someone, but I'm going to call it my own for now. Have a look at these questions, see what stuff you know. Um, I would say start somewhere down at the bottom and work your way up. So it covers some of the things that I have already taught you guys uh, in previous sessions. So my first question is asking for the functional groups in an amino acid. Who can tell me that? I'm going to give you a few seconds so that it's more than just one person. I'll have a drink of water. Oh, Hamza, last time you're going to see me, that is sad. Oh, yeah. Cool. Lovely. So functional groups, um, amino acids, spot on. Some people are saying they have an amino group, uh, sometimes called an amine group, and they also have a carboxyl group. OK, I think you guys all know that. So the amine group is one with the nitrogen and the hydrogens. The carboxyl is one with a carbon, double bond O, OH. Um, next one. What do qualitative and quantitative mean? This is something I haven't actually taught anyone at any point. So I'll be intrigued to see if you guys know this. So what do I mean by quantitative? What do I mean by qualitative? This will pop up later. Who can tell me? Qualitative, quality. Yes, that is true. Um, qual, words, quan, numbers. Lovely, yes. Uh, Mariam, so basically what we're looking at is a quantitative test is any test that will give you a number at the end, um, a qualitative, sorry, I think I said it the wrong way around, quantitative, means it will give you a number. Quantitative means you won't get a number. So I'm gonna say no number. Okay, so maybe you'll get like a color change or something like that. Okay, so qualitative has no numbers involved. 
Um, lovely. Yes, lots of you guys tell me the right answer. Uh, qualitative, more detailed, quantitative number. Qualitative doesn't necessarily mean it's more detailed. It just isn't giving you a number. It depends what you want. No, neither is better than the other. Um, they just give different things. Okay, uh, next. What are phospholipids made of? What are phospholipids composed of? Who can tell me this? I'm intrigued to see how good we are. You guys are smashing this so far. Well, there is a pause. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, Aisha. Um, lipids, phosphates, uh, kind of. So we've definitely got phosphate groups, definitely have those. I'm going to take what you said as that. So phosphate groups. Um, what else are we saying? Fatty acids, lovely. So who's that? Marianne, yes. Trace, yes. Uh, Yelena, yes. So we have two fatty acids. We have a phosphate group. And we have glycerol, which is the thing that holds it all together. Um, difference between hydrolysis and condensation. Who can remember this? This is something from a little while ago. Um, what is hydrolysis? What is condensation? Who can remember? I'm sure lots of you guys will be able to tell me which one or what makes something. Well, I'm not going to say. I'll stop talking. I'm going to give it away unintentionally, as I always tend to do. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe I need to give it away. I'm gonna start giving it away. Lovely, moon, the moon, we always stress the moon. Hydrolysis is a breaking of bonds, lovely. Hydrolysis is bond breaking, spot on. And you are right that that uses water. Um, whereas condensation is bond making. I feel like I'm turning into a chemistry teacher here. So bond making, and we're gonna say that condensation releases water, hence condensation. Okay, lovely. Um, what bonding is involved in the tertiary structure of a protein? Final two, let's try and smash through these. So tertiary structure of a protein, who can tell me? So not the primary, not the secondary, not the quaternary, tertiary. Lovely, so we've got hydrogen, well done, whoever's just said that. Uh, Mark, you're spot on. So we've got hydrogen bonds, we've got ionic bonds, anything else. Disulfide bridges, lovely. I'm not gonna be bothered to write bridges, but disulfide, any others? Uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions, spot on. Covalent bonding, lovely. Guys, yes, you smashed that. Well done, Bay of Tertiary Things. And finally, I saw some of you mentioning this earlier. So um, what food tests do you guys already know? So I saw that someone wrote uh, biuret, I think, earlier. That is all I saw. So there's a biuret test. Does anyone remember anything else? Lovely. Benedict. I always think Benedict Cumberbatch when I hear that or see that. Not many Benedicts. Uh, or Benedict, I'm monks, I don't know. Uh, Biuret, that's supposed to be a U there. Biuret, Benedict's uh, emulsion. Lovely. Uh, has anyone said the one that I was looking for? Iodine test. What is the iodine test? The iodine test is for starch. Uh, lovely. So yeah, they are the different things that we're gonna be looking at. So um, by the end of today then, it looks like you guys are recapping this. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail for some things. Um, I need you to know the test for reducing and the non-reducing sugars. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean by reducing and a non-reducing sugar. Um, we're also going to look at quantitative analysis and discuss the different reagents for proteins, lipids and starch. Okay, uh, the one thing I won't talk about and I don't know what specification this is in, but I'm not going to talk about test strips at all. Okay, it's really, really easy for whoever's whoever does that course. Um, just look into it uh, in your book or ask your teacher or something. It's honestly the tiniest little sentence, but I'm just not going to bother because most of the things, most of the courses don't cover it. Okay, uh, feel free to look at these. Come back and look on YouTube at some point. These will be here on YouTube. Uh, have a look to see if your course covers it. Um, but there is definitely one of them which does. Okay, I don't know why I'm missing edX out there. That's bizarre. Um, but anyway, I, this is covering Excel. Don't worry, but it's not fair. Um, so qualitative testing then. So if we first look at Benedict's test, Benedict's test is used for reducing sugars. Does anyone know what I mean when I say like a reducing sugar? Can anyone name a sugar which is a reducing sugar? Let's have a look. Reducing means glucose. So it doesn't mean glucose, but glucose is certainly one of these. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean glucose, but it definitely is one. Um, lovely. Yeah. Maltose is also one of these. I'll tell you what it means a little bit more in a second. Um, sucrose. Sucrose is not one. Um, galactose. I think galactose. In fact, galactose is. Um, fructose is. 
galactose is lovely. So lots of you are saying this. So um, the reducing sugars, these tend to be monosaccharides. Let's hope I can spell it. So the reducing sugars are the monosaccharides with some disaccharides. Okay. So there are some disaccharides which are reducing sugars too, but mostly we're talking about the monosaccharides. I'll tell you a little bit more about which ones are reducing in a second. Um, oh, sorry, I'm non-reducing by telling you the reducing. Uh, it'll, I'll, make sense, I'll make sense of that in a second. Okay. So mostly we're talking about the monosaccharides when we talk about this. Okay. In order to do this, te this test, it's really, really basic. You literally take your sample, which you think might contain a monosaccharide, and you put it into a boiling tube. So you add your sample to a boiling tube. So if you guys have the handout, you guys can be writing this in. So you get, um, I don't know, maybe this is quite useful uh, with things like urine. You can test to see if someone is diabetic by doing the Benedict's test. Okay, so you get a boiling tube, you put your sample in there. Okay, you then add your Benedict's solution. Nice and simple. And following that, um, you need to heat it. So it doesn't really work or it doesn't work very quickly if you leave it out in the cold. So you heat it in a water bath or let's say in a hot water bath for about five minutes or so. Okay, and essentially what you will get, I'm gonna write the time as well, let's say five minutes. I can't imagine an examiner would ever ask you to know exactly how long it is, so don't worry too much, but it is a little while. Um, but essentially what starts to happen is it almost looks like your solution is starting to bruise. So you start off with this sort of bluish sort of color. And then you know how when you get a bruise, you start off a bit blue and then you go a bit like, I don't know, green and a bit yellow and a bit brown. Essentially that's what starts to happen. So you start off blue and if it is positive, so this is my positive result, you end up with this color over here, right? It's, it's normally called like a brick red color. So that's what most examiners are looking for. So you get a brick red, um, I'm going to get rid of my positive and I'm going to write that somewhere else. And then um, because this is um, it's opaque, it's called a brick red. Uh, does anyone know the word that I'm talking for? A brick red something or another. I'm intrigued. Possibly not. Precipitate. Lovely. So we have a brick red precipitate. OK, so this is my positive result over here. And you can also get a negative result, which is uh, blue. So blue is a negative result, whereas my uh, brick red precipitate, that is a positive result. OK, um, who was asking a question? I saw someone mention something which got a bit confused. Um, I'd be very surprised if Edexcel didn't cover this, but you might be right, Aisha. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe you are right. Honestly, I can't remember. You might have to check your um, spec very quickly. Okay, so that's pretty much what the Benedict's test is. And you would have done this a lot of times. You probably did this in like year seven as well as um, like year 12 and year 13. Um, this is something that students tend to forget though, really weirdly. So I found in the past that my students tend to forget this. And um, when, the, when the question comes up in an exam, they sort of get thrown despite having done it a lot of times. So be careful with it. Um, just to have a look at this then, the reason that these sugars, these simple like hexose uh, monosaccharides the reason that these are called reducing sugars is because they've got this really weird little group. So, and it's also because glucose can kind of be in these two structures at the same time. So glucose, we're, no, we're normally familiar with glucose being this sort of ring shaped structure, right? Um, but glucose can also form this weird sort of linear glucose too, which is this one shown over here. And I think I read today that about 3% of all glucose on the planet is sort of in this sort of linear version of itself. Um, but it does mean that we get these nice properties. So because glucose can sort of change between the two and we end up getting this nice little bond that basically forms um, between these two carbons. So the carbon here and the carbon here. We end up with glucose having this ability to be able to reduce things. So reduction being um, the gain of electrons, it can be a reducing agent and it can basically be able to give electrons over really, really easily. OK, so oh, Edexcel doesn't cover this. That's lucky for you. Um, so it's really important then that in terms of reducing sugars, uh, and it doesn't come up very often, um, but I think it probably could, is that things like glucose, things like monosaccharides, um, they have a sort of a, a group uh, as part of them called a reducing group. 
Okay, so this little part here, so if you do chemistry, you might know that if you've got a double bond to an O and an H, you either get either an aldehyde or a ketone forming. Um, but this little group can basically reduce other things. Okay, and that is why it is called a reducing sugar. It's nothing more complicated than that. It's just got this weird little group that allows it to reduce stuff. Okay, um, basically by doing this, it can cause this change in the Benedict solution to make um, my solution go from blue to orange. So essentially what's going on is the blue, as you guys might be aware from doing chemistry like years and years ago, um, the blue color that you're familiar with with Benedict's is copper, right? And essentially you have copper ions or copper two plus ions. By basically reducing it, you can turn it into a different form of copper, which is copper one, I believe. And that basically turns into this weird red color. Okay, so all, all you need to worry about is reducing sugars, like for monosaccharides, have this little group here, and that can basically reduce other things. Okay, the important thing to know is that polysaccharides can't do this. So polysaccharides um, can't do this. So that is why this test, the Benedict's test, won't work for starch. Okay, um, I want to see if you guys are understanding this. Where did I say the carbons? Oh, sorry. So um, the person just asking there, each of these little crosses here, this is a little carbon. So the person getting confused of where all the carbons are. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six carbons here. There are six carbons here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, there are six carbons. Sucrose can, uh, no, sucrose, I don't think sucrose is, it, yeah, can't get my words out. Sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. So sucrose can't do this either. Okay, so, um, in terms of the reducing sugars, you need to know that all of the monosaccharides are, and the only other two that are reducing are maltose and lactose. So maltose being the thing made of two glucose molecules. So glucose plus glucose makes maltose. And for lactose is glucose plus galactose makes lactose. Okay, so these are the only two um, disaccharides, which are also reducing sugars. Um, the only reason for that is because they also have this reducing group. They've either got a ketone group somewhere or they've got an aldehyde group. Okay, um, the non reducing sugars are things like sucrose. Okay, I didn't understand why they're called reducing sugars. Yeah, I always found, Remy, when I was learning this, that your teacher will refer to these as reducing sugars, but without really telling you why. Um, and you sort of just are expected to know that glucose is a reducing sugar and I don't know, starch isn't, but don't, don't worry too much about it. I think you don't get told it because I don't think your teacher wants you to get too bogged down with it and confused. All you need to know is very, very little uh, carbohydrates or sugar molecules. They are reducing the bigger ones. They aren't. And there are some in the middle, which can kind of go either way. Okay. Um, maltose and sucrose are easy to mix up. Don't worry too much. Okay. So um, what you can do, and this is something that uh, you probably would have done in a practical at some point, I think for most of the practicals. So um, I'm sure you guys have had a lab book given to you and all that kind of thing. Um, you also are expected to know how you can test for a non-reducing sugar then. So if we're going to look to get a positive result of a non-reducing sugar, so uh, let's say we are looking for sucrose, the one which is really important in plants. If we want to get a positive result, we won't get it if we just put it in with some Benedict, heat it up for a few seconds, it just won't work. So we actually have to hydrolyze it first to sort of show this reducing group. So if we want to form our nice little aldehyde or ketone, um, you need to first hydrolyze it first. Does anyone know how you could go about doing that? So how could I uh, have this disaccharide, this fairly big molecule, how could I cut it down so that I ended up with just um, something that resembled glucose so that I could get a positive result? Does anyone know? Lovely, lots of you are telling me. So hydrochloric acid will do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, you don't, weirdly, you don't really need water. I'm pretty sure if you have hydrochloric acid, it will have some water in it because otherwise you wouldn't be able to break um, that glycosidic bond. But yeah, you have a solution of um, hydrochloric acid and you basically need to add some of that to it. That will break the bond. And then you could do the same test again and you'll get the same response. Okay, so basically what we are trying to do then is we can test to see if our reducing sugar is there by breaking, or we can test to prove that there isn't a reducing sugar there to break down our bigger molecule into a reducing sugar, okay? 
So I'd say step one, um, find out if your sample is a reducing sugar. So the first little step to this then is you need to do the stuff I've already mentioned. So you need to add some Benedicts to it, see if it causes this color change. And if it doesn't, um, excellent, move on to step two. Okay, so the second step then is we need to add some hydrochloric acid. So you add hydrochloric acid um, and you also need to boil it. You need to get it really warm. So add hydrochloric acid, um, boil it. Don't know why I did that capital. Apologies to those of you who are better at English than me. Um, you boil it and essentially that will hydrolyze your bond. Okay, so this will hydrolyze your bond, your glycosidic bond. Okay, um, following that, it's never really great to leave it acidic. So we tend to um, then neutralize it. Okay, so you then neutralize your solution. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you use sodium, um, what is it? The name's totally gone. NaHCO3, NaHCO3. Can anyone tell me what NaHCO3 would be? I'm intrigued. Oh, someone's got it. Sodium hydrogen carbonate, lovely. So you take some sodium hydrogen carbonate, you add that to it, and essentially that will neutralize it. So you turn it from this acidic solution into something a bit less um, acidic. And then when you've done that, because we know that sucrose, and you should know this, um, is made from glucose and fructose, uh, when you do this, you end up having your glucose, which now exists, and your fructose that now exists, which are now reduced in sugars. So you then uh, repeat Benedict's test and you should get a positive result. Oh, don't worry, I wrote result. Um, repeat Benedict's test. So in the first step, we do reduce in sugar test. Yes, Remy. So you've got to do the test first to then see if you need to do the reduce in sugar test, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so just to get a good idea as well, and this is sort of additional information which I've never ever seen being asked. Um, Benedict solution, you guys need to be aware that it contains um, copper sulfate, so CuSO4. So that is why it's blue. Okay, essentially what you are doing is, and I'm going to try to not do too much chemistry here, um, we know that copper is plus two, we know that SO4 is minus two, so we've got Cu2 plus and we're turning that into Cu singular plus. If it has become a bit less positive, what have I added to it? What have I added to it if it's become a bit less positive? Can anyone tell me this? I'm intrigued. It's gained an electron, lovely. So uh, let's do, let's put an electron somewhere over here, right? So an electron plus copper two plus forms copper one plus, and that is reduction. If you add an electron to something, that is reduction. Okay, uh, I wouldn't ever expect that you'd you'd need to know this little equation here, but for those of you that are doing chemistry and like chemistry, maybe that's an easy way to help you remember this. So you're reducing your copper two plus into copper one plus. Okay, um, moving swiftly on. Oh, when results come out negative, if non-reducing sugars are present when Benedict's test is used, um, Amisha, because you have made some glucose, uh, you'll get a positive result. So it might not be as um, brick red as using just glucose, because you're right you'll probably have some sucrose left, but you will start to get this change into orange. Um, yeah, lovely. So looking into the next one then, it all gets nice and straightforward from here, to be honest. So starch is tested using something called the iodine test. Okay, uh, literally what you get, uh, what you do is you get something to test. So uh, maybe you get a bit of bread, which is what I've always tended to do it with, or a cracker or something. Uh, you get some iodine, put a few drops on, and essentially you go from this nice yellow solution to this really dark blue-black solution. Okay, it tends to be called either blue or black. You won't be wrong if you say either. Or. I'd probably say black because it's darker and you're sort of proving that you know what you're on about. Um, someone's just realized how horrible their chemistry knowledge is. Don't worry, you're doing biology now, so don't worry about chemistry. Um, but essentially what's happening here then uh, with the iodine solution is iodine basically gets trapped into these little coils. So with starch, um, hopefully you guys remember that it's made of two different things. Anyone know what starch is made from? I would be impressed again to see you guys remembering what starch is made from. The two sort of molecules that break it up. 
amylopectin and amylose, lovely. So we have amylose and amylopectin, um, amylopectin being the long branched one, amylose being the more straight chained, it does coil up a bit. Um, essentially what goes on is iodine gets trapped. So iodine gets trapped within uh, amylose. So iodine gets trapped within the amylose and it basically just stains it this dark color, right? So if you don't have starch present, it can't get trapped and it doesn't really go anywhere. But because it gets trapped, um, basically you have some reaction happening where it basically starts to turn black. Okay, that's all you need to know. So iodine gets trapped within the amylose, let's call it the amylose helix to make sure we're as specific as possible. Okay, that's all you need to know about starch. I will make this harder in a second, don't you worry, those of you who are thinking, cool, this is easy. Um, so final, well, halfway through actually, the other two tests, nice and straightforward, uh, are the biuret's test. So the biuret test is a test for the presence of proteins. Okay, uh, in terms of when we're looking for proteins, this test is actually looking for peptide bonds. So strangely, it doesn't actually give a positive result um, if you have uh, an amino acid. If you just have one amino acid, this will actually give a negative result, which is a bit weird. Um, but basically you go from blue to purple. So you can call this purple. You don't need to give it any of these nonsense names like mauve or something that you had to for GCSE. But purple is my positive result. Um, and essentially your biuret test is in sort of two, two stages. And I've seen it either written as biuret A, biuret B, or it tends to just call it what it actually is. So you have to make it alkali for this to work. So you have some sodium hydroxide. So this could be, I'll write it down as I've sometimes seen it as biuret A. Okay, so sodium hydroxide will make it nice and alkali. Uh, that's biuret A. And then you need to add copper sulfate to it, which is why it's this nice blue color again. Um, copper sulfate or biuret B. And if you basically have a protein present, um, you don't need to heat it up. You basically mix those two together with your sample and it will go purple if it is positive. Um, did you do DNA yet? No, I'm not gonna do DNA at all. We don't really have a test for DNA. Okay, so biuret, nice and straightforward. Um, we're just gonna be looking at adding something to make it alkali and then adding copper sulfate. With this test, guys, you do need to know these names. You need to know NaOH and CuSO4. So sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate. So in your exams, they would expect you to know that your biuret is alkali because it has sodium hydroxide and then you add copper sulfate to it as well. Um, presence, you said the presence of proteins is finding peptide bonds. Um, yes, so if I am looking for a protein, I'm actually, so this test is actually looking for my peptide bond. So it's looking for the, um, the N, C, but N's got a H on it and the C's got a H on it as well. So you're looking for your peptide bond here. That is how a biuret test works. Okay, um, the NaOH is just used to make this alkali. This test has to be alkali for it to work. Um, I'll show you the kind of question you'll get on this. So after this last one, I'll show you the question which has tricked lots of students before. Um, so finally then, lipids can be tested for using an emulsion test. Again, really, really straightforward. Um, basically, all you do is you get your sample of whatever you want. Uh, you add ethanol to it. Um, something that you are expected to know is that ethanol will basically dissolve a lipid. So most lipids, I think all lipids, will dissolve in ethanol. Okay, so you add ethanol and it will dissolve. What you then do is you need to mix it. And you then need to add a bit of water. So you then um, add, add water, or maybe you could say mix with water. Um, something along those lines. I don't think it matters too much. But essentially what you do, it, uh, or shake with water, something like that. essentially what you're doing is by adding a bit of water, all of the lipids that were dissolved into your ethanol, they basically start to fall out of solution. So they stop being in their solution, the water is diluted in the mixture and your, um, your lipids basically fall out and you end up with this nice sort of milky layer, right? So your uh, white emulsion test or your milky white precipitate Something like that would be what you are looking for as your positive test. So your milky white precipitates. Okay. Um, Biuret B was copper sulfate. Is water the control of the experiment? So water is not really a control with this. 
Um, in fact, let's actually change this word here to emulsion as opposed to precipitate again. I'm going to try and make sure I'm giving you all of the absolute best wording that I can. Um, person that's telling me about is this being a, is water a control for this? Controls are just things you do to check that your experiment's working. So a control is just there as a comparison. Um, so water isn't really a control for this, I wouldn't say. Lipids do not dissolve in water because of the polarity. Yes, exactly. So a lipid can't dissolve in water, hence um, you guys have seen oil floating on top of water, I would assume. Uh, basically, that's what you're forcing to do by adding the water. So by adding the water, you're forcing um, the fat to slightly separate from the water and you end up with a nice cloudy layer which contains all of your fat. Um, I forgot to use precipitation or emulsion in OCR. Okay, I think you'll probably be fine if you forget to use these words, but I think you want to try and get in the habit of just using them as often as possible because your examiners are looking out for these. So in, in exams, you tend to get like these words underlined or in bold or something, and they do tend to quite like them. So be careful with it. Okay, so tell me how you are feeling. Let me know how you guys are feeling with this so far, and I'll give you an exam question to see what you have uh, got so far out of this. I'm intrigued. And this question is really hard. It doesn't look hard, but I promise you it is hard. 1.5. Nice. I'm glad someone sent me an emoji. I haven't seen one of them for a while. That's, that makes, makes me feel good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> Lovely. I think this is the first time I haven't had a free. I'm almost expecting someone to post a free now just to basically make me feel bad about myself. But guys, excellent. I'm glad you guys are feeling okay with this. Um, right, so <laughs> have a look at this question then. Hopefully my head isn't too much in the way of it. So uh, a student has set up the experiment shown in the diagram below. So here is an experiment. We've got something called Viskin tubing, which if you haven't heard of, it's basically like a membrane. It is partially permeable. Um, I'll let you think about that for a second. I've got a mixture of starch. Um, so starch suspension is in here. So there's a load of starch in here. And I've got some amylase thrown in as well for good measure. Uh, the material from which Viskin tubing is made from is partially permeable. That's really important. After 15 minutes, the students remove samples from the liquid in the beaker. So a student has got a pipette and has taken some of this stuff. He has a pipette, apparently. I'm not going to draw anything else to make that look dodgy. Um, so they've taken it from there and they've also taken a sample from here. Okay. She drew the table below to record her results. A biochemical test, so the biuret reagent by by your experiment, whatever it is, um, the iodine in potassium iodide. So that is a fair point. Um, just so you know, iodine you have to add it as potassium iodide, which is Ki. Don't worry too much about it, but that's just what it is. And finally, Benedict's reaction, uh, reagent. Okay, yeah, you do use this to test for osmosis. You are spot on. So tell me what you think will be positive. So uh, let's look at um, the liquid from a beaker first. Okay. Who thinks that that's going to be positive for biuret? Who thinks that that's going to be positive for iodine? Who thinks that's going to be positive for Benedict's? I'm intrigued to see what you say. Okay, so post your post your answers, and I'll tell you if you're right or wrong in a few seconds. <laughs> Izzy King, I hope you're not just saying no. You're not going to do this. Okay, so liquid from the beaker. So we think that it will pass Benedict's test. We think it will pass the iodine test. Negative, positive, positive, no, no, yes. Okay, no, no, yes, I'm intrigued with Trace. Benedict's been right. Okay, I think everyone agrees that the liquid in the beaker will have Benedict's reagent, okay? I know this is hard to sort of get across. I kind of want to hear why, why you think that. Um, so Benedict's reagent, and we're going to talk about that, I guess, in our justification down here. Benedict's reagent, Ben, oh, okay. Benedict's reagent, sorry, that was me responding to Izzy, I think there. Benedict's reagent is the one that tests for reducing sugars. Okay, so using our knowledge, I know that there is starch in here. So there's this big molecule, there you go, I'm gonna draw a big old long molecule there. There's a big old molecule of starch, right? Um, if I add some amylase to it, you guys hopefully know that amylase breaks down starch into maltose. Everyone always thinks it breaks it down into glucose, but it breaks it down into maltose, okay? So maltose, uh, as it is, is really, really small. So maltose is tiny. So little maltose molecules are gonna start to slip out of this. So because this viscin tube is partially permeable, maltose will start to slip out of it. It's small enough to move out of it, and therefore it will give a positive test. So justify your answers. Um, let's say Benedict's, 
Benedict will test positive. Um, outside. As Maltose is made, I should have made this box bigger. As Maltose is made um, and is small enough to diffuse out. Oh, that's definitely not space. It's uh, space. It's also reducing sugar. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to try and confuse you a bit then. So this one here, iodine and potassium, uh, iodine in potassium iodide, that one is actually negative. So that one is a negative. So I won't get any starch leaving. Okay, so there'll be no starch leaving here. Okay, so there's no starch leaving because starch is massive. So starch is going to be absolutely stuck um, inside. So starch can't get out. So uh, maybe we want to say starch is too large to move out. Ooh. Starch is too large to move out. Just realised that you guys watching these videos are going to get so many more exam questions than the rest of the people um, doing these A-levels, which is really cool. Um, but starch is too large to move out, so that'll give a negative test. Biuret, uh, same problem. So liquid from a beaker, um, biuret, there'll be no protein outside. Okay, there'll be no protein outside because, and then here, here's a bit of a weird thing, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, Buy your app, there's just no protein, it'll get outside. What do you guys think for um, in the Viscan tubing then? So in my Viscan tubing, what do we reckon? So in my Viscan tubing, what do we reckon? Positive, lots of you are saying positive. Yes, yes, no. So intriguing. Positive for Benedict. So yeah, this one's definitely positive. So there'll definitely be some starch, which is broken down into maltose. Here is a little bit of maltose. Not all of that will have broken down left, right? So some of that will stay within. Um, the iodine, the examiners actually let you have a cross or a tick. So I'm going to give it a tick because I think it's in 15 minutes, which is all the time we have. I think it's very unlikely that all of the starch will have broken down. But yeah, inside my Viscan tubing, I reckon there will still be some starch in there. So I reckon we'd be able to get uh, a bit of that brown colour if we took a sample and added some iodine. This is the weird one, which no one ever sort of expects. This is what my students got confused with. So the biuret test here is actually positive. Can anyone tell me what protein there is which is going to be in that sample? Because this threw me when I looked at this for the first time. Yeah, lovely, amylase. So the reason biuret's test is positive is because amylase is inside, but amylase being a protein is really big, so it can't leave, right? So in terms of justifying our answer, uh, if I carry on sort of over this way, we need to say um, biuret's test, biuret test, uh, amylase is too large to leave. Or is too large to diffuse. And then if we're going to talk about the iodine test, uh, we need to say the same thing. Iodine test is negative as starch. Ooh, let's get rid of that little dot. Ooh. Uh, as starch is also too large to leave. Cool, that's a long answer. Um, so yeah, that was three marks there. And then I think this one down here was something like four marks. Um, so that's all the stuff that you'd need to say here. Yeah, amylase is an enzyme. Those of you saying, um, like, why is it amylase and getting confused? Well done, all of you said that, which is loads of you. Um, amylase is a protein, and it's just really easy to forget that enzymes are proteins, I think. I think it's just something that when you see this question in an exam, your brain sort of goes blank. So I've got a little enzyme in here. Um, there you go, it looks like little Pac-Man. My little enzyme is too big to get out, so it just stays in my Viscan tube in and I get a positive result inside. Okay, uh, for Benedict, what one don't you get, Lillian? Why, what one about Benedict's being positive? Do you mean inside or outside? Or should I try to explain both? I'll try and explain both before you answer. So Benedict is positive outside because when you break down starch with amylase, you make um, maltose, which is small enough to diffuse. Oh, I see. And why do you get it in the Viscan tubing? So with diffusion, and this will be a lesson which I'll do at some point in the future for those of you that sign up for Snap Provides Ultimate Package. Um, 
basically it will never diffuse all out. You end up forming like an equilibrium where lots of it diffuses out and you end up having an equal amount both sides. So you basically end up in a situation where you'll have, I don't know, um, one mole per decimeter cubed inside, one mole per decimeter cubed outside, and it will just maintain that concentration gradient. Okay, it'll become equal, it reaches equilibrium. So that's why you get maltose both inside and outside. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so quantitative testing, this is a little bit trickier, but it's not really too much more. I'm really gonna really look at Benedict for this. Okay, so in terms of quantitative testing, we are looking to try and find a number. Okay, and there's a really easy way to do this um, with something which has a color, uh, which makes our life really straightforward. So we can quantitatively test for reducing sugars with Benedict's test. So um, basically, if you've got lots of sugars around, um, this could be quite useful because you can test how much sugar there is, right? So going back to talking about someone peeing and finding out if they have diabetes, if they've got a tiny amount of glucose, that will give a positive test um, for my Benedict reagent in a qualitative sort of manner. But if I, if I know how much glucose there is, um, as a doctor, that could make it really obvious to me that they've either got um, in a, a later stage of diabetes and maybe they're in danger of uh, some real issues, like your foot can become really infected with diabetes and you need it, which would just be awful. Um, or maybe you're at the initial stage, and you might be able to reverse it. So a quantitative um, sort of method is really important here. So in terms of what happens to the mass of my precipitate, if I've got more sugar, um, there'll be more precipitate. So the mass of precipitate will increase. Okay, so the more sugar there is, the more orange precipitate there will be. Okay, because I said um, that in this reaction, I've got Cu2 plus uh, turning into Cu plus, um, the more sugar I have, the less blue it will be. So the more sugar I have, the less blue it will be. So the amount of Cu2 plus will start to decrease, okay? Um, and the uses of this, go on, because I was mentioning this a second ago, uh, we use this a lot for like blood glucose levels. So blood glucose testing or something like that. Okay, um, so this is why we're doing our quantitative test, just to get an idea of uh, how much sugar there is. Someone's saying, does glucose smell? It doesn't really smell, but there is an interesting fact that you might not know about this. Um, back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean like way before I was born, the way that doctors tested to see if someone was diabetic or not was they used to get a cup of uh, a patient's pee, give it a quick sip, like throw it around their mouth a bit, try and get all the flavours like on, the, on their palate. And if it tasted sweet, that meant that they had pee. Uh, if, if they had pee, that meant they had diabetes because they were peeing out glucose. If it tasted however pee tastes, I don't really know. Um, then that meant they didn't have diabetes. So that was that was the way they used to test it back in the day. Yeah, I know, it's pretty gross, isn't it? Um, but it's clever, thinking about it, it's really, really clever. But before you had any of these sort of ways of measuring things, that was how people used to do things. Um, should I write down mass of precipitate or mass of emulsion? <laughs> uh, for this one, precipitate, because if we're looking at Benedict reagent, we're looking at precipitate. That's why doctors get paid a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not joking about that. That is 100% true. Um, so, the way that we do this then, the way the scientists test this is they have something called colorimetry, right? And this is not to be confused with calorimetry spelt with an A, which is measuring the amount of calories and therefore the amount of energy. Colorimetry is looking at color. Um, but essentially what it's doing is we are looking at the amount of light that can get through our solution. So you have these sort of weird little boxes, which you might've seen. Um, they sort of look a bit like this. So it's a big old box. This is like an aerial view. And you have a little hole where you put your sample in and basically there'll be a big old light bulb somewhere here apparently that's a light bulb oh there you go that's a light bulb and it will shine a ray of light through it and essentially the more light that can get through it um the less dark its color is so the less precipitate there is okay colorimetry uh, rheumetry can either measure the absorbance how much light is absorbed by your solution or how much is transmitted so there'll be a little sort of um, device over here which will say yeah this amount of light has got through so the darker it is the less light will get through so the more glucose the less light will get through okay um, so in terms of what we need to know then Cobb sulfate is this sort of light blue color so one way that you could use colorimetry a really nice way to do it is uh, you get something called a filter 
And if you guys remember like physics in year eight or year nine or something, you have filters. And essentially what they do is they only allow one color of light to go through. So in our case, we would use a blue filter so the orange doesn't affect it at all. So the only light that we're looking at, the only light that we're absorbing is going to be the blue light because we're not really that bothered by the orange light or the red light. OK, so uh, we would use a color filter, um, so a blue filter. Um, to only measure blue light. Okay. Um, in terms of how we use this, then it gets a little bit more complicated, but not not really too much more. Hang on. So, what's the difference between emulsion and precipitate? Precipitate is like a solid, and emulsion is a mixture of two things. So, the uh, alcohol and the fat is an emulsion. Um, we use orange filter when we did it. Yeah, yeah, you could do this with an orange filter, uh, Sada. It makes it makes no difference. You just choose one filter color depending on what you've got. So if I know that my Benedict is going to go from blue to orange, I would choose to either use blue or orange. Um, if I was doing this with the BioRet test, I would either use purple or blue or something. Okay, it doesn't really matter. So what is this used for? It's used to tell me how much glucose there is, right? So to give you an example, let's say this has absolutely loads of glucose in it, right? Loads of glucose. Then essentially what's gonna happen is this solution here will, it will turn completely orange, right? So if my solution here turns orange, the amount of blue light getting through it is gonna be very, very low. So if I know that the amount of blue in there is very, very low, that means that by default, it must have turned orange. So therefore there must be absolutely loads of glucose. So if there's no blue, then there's got to be a whole lot of reducing sugar in there. Conversely, if there's not lots of glucose, it will stay very, very blue. And then I'll get, an, I'll get a result saying that it's, it's like not got any glucose in it at all. Um, yeah, for those of you talking about transmission and absorption, when I used to teach this to students, I would literally just like say, just pick as arbitrarily as possible. Just pick which one you want to do. It makes no difference. Um, people getting confused by this. Basically, uh, if I shined a light through my glass of water, then all of that light would get through. And that would indicate that there is not very much glucose in here, right? If I poured a load of glucose in here and then um, added Benedict's and it went orange, less light is going to get through because it's gone all orange. Okay, so if I've got lots of light going through it, um, it means that there's not a lot of stuff in there. So there's a lot of, well, there's a lack of glucose. If it goes orange, there's lots of glucose, less light will go through. And my special machine here, which is my calculator, which detects the amount of light going through, will say there's hardly any light getting through. I don't know why I need to move my calculator to show that. Okay, um, steps of carrying this out, there's not really many steps. You get a little uh, thing called a, a curvette, I think it's called. You pour a little bit in and essentially you test how much stuff can go through it. Uh, you do tend to use a, um, a blank first though. So you tend to put a bit of water in first as a comparison. So everything is compared to your water to make sure that you have something, I don't know, which lets theoretically 100% of the light through. So 100% of my light should get through this glass because it's water. It won't because it's dirty and I haven't cleaned it properly. But 100% of my light should get through. So anything darker than that won't let quite as much through. Okay. Um, does it calculate glucose present? It doesn't. Excellent, Moon. I'm glad it is it's still called a cuvette. Hmm. So to calculate my amount of glucose then, uh, you use something called a calibration curve. So essentially the way this works is um, you, take some, you take some known concentrations of glucose. So you'd make up some concentrations of glucose. So you take known uh, concentrations of glucose. Or oh, let's say glucose and Benedict. Right, so look, this person has taken 5%, uh, well, they've done all of them, haven't they? They've done two and a half, five, seven and a half, ten. 10, but they've got some known concentrations of glucose, okay? So they've got their known concentrations. Um, the thing in front of the filter, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. I think it's just meant to be something in the way of the light. Don't worry about it. Um, so I've got some known, uh, known concentrations of glucose. 
And then what this person has done, what this student or this technician or scientist or whoever has done is they have got a little sample of it. They've put it in a cuvette. So it's a little square thing which you can put samples in. And then they have measured the absorbance. So they found the concentration of five grams per decimeter of glucose has an absorbance of 0.2. Okay, they found that 10 has an absorbance of 0.4. 15 has an absorbance of, um, what's that, 0.58 or whatever, and so on. Okay, so they are seeing that as they increase their glucose, it is getting more orange and therefore less light is getting through. Less light is being able to be transmitted through, more is getting absorbed. Okay, so um, take known concentrations of glucose. Uh, apparently when I made this, um, apparently I should have said that this Benedict's is the second step. Okay, known concentrations of glucose at Benedict's. Sorry about that for those of you that probably wrote this down. I just don't want to make, I don't want it. I don't want it to look like that there is an empty one. Um, add Benedict's um, and then you measure, measure your absorbance, okay, or your transmission. Okay, what you then do, if you want to know uh, how much glucose I have in something, so let's say, let's go back to my glass, right? I want to know how much glucose is in here. What I would do is I take a solution of this, so I take a sample of it, sorry, and I put it in a cuvette and I put it into my colorimeter. Let's say that it has an absorbance of, I don't know, 0.01. So let's say that I've got a example here where my water has exactly that amount in. Okay, so the, the sample that I'm testing has an absorbance of 0.01. All I do is I'd follow it down on this line and I see that it is between zero and five, slightly closer to zero. So the concentration of glucose in there, I would say is roughly uh, two grams per decimeter cubed. Okay, so that is essentially how this works, right? So you do your known concentrations, you add Benedict's, you measure your absorbance, and then you take whatever you are gonna test. So here's my water that I'm gonna test. You find its absorbance, you follow it along the line. So look, my absorbance was here. You follow it along the line, and then you go down. So you follow it along um, your y-axis, go down your x-axis, and you read off basically what it says. Okay, so let's see what you guys are saying. So it doesn't calculate the amount. It gives you an idea of how much there is. Um, so yeah, it's given me some number. So that's why it is quantitative. Um, <laughs> for A-level, it's not possible to cram in the last few months. No, it is not. Why does it turn orange after adding Benedict's? Because you have reduced copper two plus to copper plus. Um, copper two plus is blue, copper plus is orange. Um, do you ever need to draw a tangent? Yes, you do need to be able to draw a tangent. Uh, the copper in the Benedict's juice um, doesn't the graph plateau when the glucose runs out? So with this graph, uh, no. So um, it can't get above one. So at some point it might curve off here. Yeah, you are right. It can't get higher than one. So I guess you could use that to quite easily say, well, um, it's got a, it's got an absorbance of one, therefore it's got to be above 25 or whatever. Uh, so more glucose is less light. Uh, yeah, so think about it. Think about it logically, yeah? And be prepared to see them talk about absorbance and transmission. So there's my light. Here is my cuvette. And then here is my computer thing that reads it, right? Uh, if this is really, really dark, it's really, really red, I think about how much light is going to go through. It's going to be practically nothing, right? So I'll draw a really thin line hitting this. So if it's really, really light, nothing's going to get through. So my absorbance, the amount of light that my cuvette has absorbed is going to be massive, right? Um, if I had a solution which was had less glucose in and it wasn't quite as orange, it was only a bit orange, then maybe more light would get through, so the absorbance would be less. Conversely, your transmission would be higher. Okay, um, cool. I'm glad you get it, Danny. Um, right, how are you guys feeling with this then? I've got one exam question. In fact, you have a choice of exam question because I'm not going to do both. I'm actually, no, right, screw that. I'm not going to do the wordy one because you've just done it. I'll show you what the question is um, very quickly, but I'm not going to do the one. I'm going to give you a mathsy one. But yeah, show me how you're feeling. Show me how you're feeling. Oh, someone said great. Thank you. That's really nice. One and a half. I can take one and a half. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. Those of you feeling like you're a two at the moment, um, 
just watch this again. Go through it again. I think you'll feel a bit better. I think it's just, if you haven't learned this for a while, it might be just a bit, I don't know. Um, guys, this is a question I was talking about. I'm not going to go through this one. Uh, it just says, describe how a scientist could obtain data to produce a calibration curve, right? Um, as we said earlier, um, no, known samples or known concentrations of glucose, add Benedict's, find out their absorption, and take your sample and compare it to those, right? So I'm going to skip that. Here is a question I would like to do with you. So this is a really hard question to have a quick look at. Um, and this is something which I found earlier today and I spent a little while talking to some other biologists about how I'd go about doing it. So it says a 0.4 centimeter cube sample of plasma. So the stuff that makes your blood liquid. Um, a 0.4 centimeter cube sample of plasma from a person uh, infected with rubella was diluted by a factor of 10 to the minus three. So I've written over that, so 10 to the minus three from its original concentration. It was found to have a mean absorbance of 0.24 at 492 nanometers, okay? That means that 492 nanometers, that is the wavelength of light that they're on about. So that means they have a filter um, which has 400, well, which only allows light with a wavelength of 492 nanometers through. Um, through. All that means is they put a filter in the way. Otherwise, that sentence there doesn't mean anything. It's just a filter in the way. Uh, using a standard curve of absorbance of light at 492 of known antibody concentration shown below, calculate the mass of antibody present in one centimeter cubed of the original sample of plasma. Give your answer in milligrams per centimeter cubed. This is a bit blurry, is it? I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry. Um, if it makes your life any easier, I'll draw one line for you here. So if we're looking at, what is it, 0.24, Yes, if we're looking at an absorbance of 0 0.24, um, I won't be able to draw this very well. Just very quickly as well, so that everyone knows how to do this. Look, if you've got one, two, three, four, five. So you've got five boxes. I probably don't need to tell you this, but just in case you're confused. Five boxes equals 0 0.2, right? You know that one box therefore equals 0 0.04. I'm going to check my maths is right with that, because that was very quick. Um, 0.25. Yes. Right. Okay. So just very quickly to help you out with this, uh, 0.24 is going to be this one here, which comes down there. And apparently, when you do that with a nice straight line, that gives you the number of eight. Okay. So I have eight nanograms per centimeter cubed. You would just skip this question. Remy, no, never skip the question. You can always work something out with these, right? And you sort of take the units that they're after and you just logically work through. Okay, um, yeah, sorry that the quality isn't great with this. So to do this question then guys, the first thing that we need to look at is I think this bit here. So they've said that they've used a 0 0.4 centimeter cubed sample. So in 0 0.4, I'll do with a dilution in a second. In a 0 0.4 centimeter cubed sample, we've got eight nanograms per centimeter cubed, right? Because they want the mass present in one centimeter cubed, the first thing I need to do is if I know there's eight nanograms per centimeter cubed in 0.4, I need to know how much there would be in one. So in one centimeter cubed, I need to know roughly what I've got. Okay, so um, there are two ways you could do this maths. You could either do, um, you could find out what you need to times 0.4 by to turn it into one. Or if you do some nice little maths, you can actually do that by just doing eight over 0 0.4, right? So if I find out, so you could do one divided by 0 0.4, um, which is 2.5, you times both of them by 2.5, and it gives you the same answer. So that gives you 20, do this, it also gives you 20, okay? So uh, let's go with that. So in one centimeter cubed, I'll get rid of this. In one centimeter cubed, I've got 20 nanograms per centimeter cubed. Um, let's, let's have a look. Um, y axis is absorbance, yeah. I'm a little confused what we're talking about. Anyway, um, use your four as a magnifier on your laptop. Oh, good shout. Uh, 20 nanograms per centimeter cubed, lovely. Why did you take eight? Because uh, this number here is going to be eight. So five, six, seven, eight. Is that? Um, Okay, so if I know I've got 20 nanograms per centimeter cubed, the next thing they've told us up here 
is it was diluted by a factor of 10 to the minus three. So you've got to times this number by 10 to the three, which is a thousand. So if you times that by a thousand, you end up with 20,000 nanograms per centimeter cubed. And then the final step then is they want you to give your answer in milligrams per centimeter cubed. Right? So if you want to turn 20,000 into um, milligrams from nanograms, you first you need to turn, well, you don't need to. Um, I would turn it into micrograms first. So there you go, micrograms per centimeter cubed. So I know that nano is absolutely tiny and micro is a bit bigger. So I know that for each one, there is a jump of a, of a thousand for meters, um, millimeters, micrometers, nanometers, picometers, whatever. Um, so I know that this number needs to be a bit smaller. If nanograms are tiny, I know I'd have fewer micrograms. So I'm gonna turn that into 20 um, micrograms per centimeter cubed. And then if I want to turn that into milligrams, which is what the answer is asking us for, um, then I've got to divide 20 by 1,000 again. So 20 divided by 1,000 is going to be 0.0. .0. Let's check that again. I'm being first. Lovely. So that is my final answer then, guys. Seems a bit complicated. The person who said they wouldn't even attempt this, um, you, need, you, need to, you need to try it. You need to get in the habit of not seeing maths and turning off. You need to see that, look, they've given you 0.4. And you need to turn that into centimeters cubed at some point. So you need to times that number or the number that you get down here by whatever it is to turn that into one. If you just do that initial bit, you'll always get a mark. So never be afraid to, to get something wrong, but always be careful of these things, right? Always actually attempt it. Otherwise, you're just throwing away marks. You can always get one or two of these. Um, NG and big NG, there isn't a difference. Oh. So if you're asking, maybe you're asking what the difference is between NG and then that. So that is nanogram, whereas that is micro. So it's a weird little U thing. It's not an N, it's a weird U with a tail. Maybe I should draw it a bit like that. That might be how you're familiar with it. How did I get eight? Person asking that, look, I followed my 0.24 across and I came down to eight, which is here. Why do you times 20 by 1,000? I times 20 by 1,000 because they said it was diluted. Hang on, if I rub out some of this stuff. But they said it was diluted by a factor of 10 to the minus 3. So I needed to times it by 1,000 to turn to undilute it kind of thing. Okay, guys. Right. I'm going to finish this off here. Feel free to carry on asking questions. I might be able to get back to it in a second. Um, but for those of you that like are sort of new to Snap Revise, um, you won't know what I'm on about. Those of you who have been watching these videos for a while, you'll know that I've been saying for the last four weeks that Snap Revise 2.0 is coming really, really soon. And it finally has arrived. And I'm, I'm sure lots of you have seen this already. But I thought I'd just give you a quick look at what Snap Revise looks like. Okay, so just so you guys can all see this really cool service that we're offering you. Oh, don't want you to see that. This is what I can see, by the way. Um, and it's annoying that it's popped up there. And if I put this down here. There you go. Right, guys, yeah, if you if you want to get an account with us, which I very much would recommend you do, and you can get a free one as well, which will give you a bit of a preview of what to get. Like I can show you some stuff. So if I type the facts, I'm going to sign up for a new account so you guys can see this. So I'm going to pretend that I'm one of you guys, right? I'm going to be a student now. I'm going to check that you guys can still see this as well. I'm assuming you probably can. Lovely. Um, right, so let's go for me. Let's go for Ollie, Vaughan, I don't know. Ollie Vaughney, that'll make sense. Um, and if I go for an email address, so Ollie at Snap Revise, let's go for Ollie plus demo two at Snap Revise or something. There you go, that, that'll make sure I don't get all these emails all the time, dot com. Um, okay, and if I go for my password, oh, I don't know, let's go for I am amazing. There you go. And let's go for my school. I'll go for my old school when I was a kid. There you go, Shanford High School. And I am going to be in year 12. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to get all the discounts as well. I want all the discounts which we send out all the time and the study tips and all that stuff and the special offers. So I'm going to take that. Um, I'll show you what this is. Right. So essentially, what you do if you get onto this is you'll get asked what you do. So uh, I did biology, I did AQA, I did chemistry. I think I did LXL chemistry, did history. History's not there. Oh, history is there. Hmm. Uh, history. I can't remember what I did. Probably OCR. I think. Um, let's go. Now I'll show you what we've got. So choose targets. <laughs> Obviously, I want an A star in all of them. 
because that is easy apparently. Um, and I am looking for, nah, my grades are really amazing. I'm, struggling, nah, nah, nah. I'm looking for a smart and interactive resource. Mm. Um, look, what I can show you is if I sort of go through some of these, I'll show you what comes up. If I go to the trial for A-level biology, and this is what all of you guys can have a look at by the way, uh, I can scroll through these. Some of them are locked, um, but you can unlock them if you sort of sign up or whatever, as you could probably expect. Um, but what I can do, look, I can click on, say, carbohydrates. I want to know about carbohydrates. And I'll show you what it comes up with. So you start off and it will give you like this diagnostic little quiz. So let's get some of them right and some of them wrong. So which of the following elements present in carbohydrates? Uh, I reckon it's something. Yes. Um, next one. Which of the following statements is true about monosaccharides? Yeah, that's soluble and sweet tasting. Lovely. That was a total guess, so that was cool. Which of the following is a correct formula for glucose? I'm going to get this wrong on purpose, so don't have a go at me. Oh, no, I don't know. That. Um, term for molecules that share the same chemical formula but differ in spatial arrangement. Uh, I'm going to get it wrong again. Dimmers or dimers uh, and random it up. Oh, God, this one goes on for a long time. That was lucky. That was just a random guess. Uh, come on. There you go. Look, so I get a result. So apparently I know 57% of stuff, which is pretty useful. Um, here's the stuff I don't know, glucose, isomers, diacetylides. If I click on get started, check this out. So look, it'll come up on the side with the things that I did know, introducing the stuff. I don't really know too much about glucose. I don't really know too much about disaccharides. And essentially what I can do is I can basically start watching free these. So apparently I knew this one, which is why it's gone green at the bottom here. Um, so maybe I won't worry about that one. Um, but what I can do is I can say that I've done that. Um, and I can then look at the glucose video. There should be a glucose video. There you go. Here is a video about glucose that I can watch. And it's gone orange because I don't know it yet. But look, if I sort of fill it in, I think it should start to go a bit green. Maybe not. Maybe it's getting confused. Um, yeah, it does that. There you go. So as soon as this is filled up, that's all done. Um, if you guys end up like signing up to our premium account, our like ultimate package, then you will have this, you'll have online tutor support. So if you haven't got something in the video, you can basically ask a question and then someone like me will answer it. Um, but let's say I've done that. Let's say I've done this, uh, mark as complete. Let's say I've done this and I'm getting irritated that this keeps showing up. So I'm gonna get rid of that, uh, mark as complete. Um, it will then take me to a little quiz. So here are some quizzes, if I get started with this, which I've told you guys about before where it will test me again, see what's going on. So this is, uh, these are the smart quizzes, which basically will give me questions based on what I do and don't know, right? So it will go through them and it will tell me what I don't know and I can see what I've actually learned. Okay. Um, and then I get an exam question as well, this is quite cool. So at the very end, I get an exam question, it will tell me what the question is and then ultimately it will go through it and it will tell me what the like main things are that I needed to worry about and how to get my marks and whatnot. Um, when you've looked at your videos and you've done that and I've done however much of what I've needed to do, I can look at my exam pack. So look, uh, here is something we've got. So a question can be state one function of carbohydrates or maybe I wanna do just for hard questions. Uh, apparently there aren't any hard questions there. Apparently it's too easy. Uh, I'll do the medium question. I'll write something in and then was I right? Click on it, bam, there you go. I can check if I was actually right and I can look at whatever marks were. Okay, so these are all questions which are meant to be like um, sort of somewhat for you, they're designed for you, it's meant to be smart tech to check that you've actually understood stuff. Um, and then finally, look, here is a nice little revision guide. So I think I mentioned these to you lot, if you've watched these videos before. But essentially, look, here is everything that you need to know about carbohydrates, if I scroll down a bit. So lovely, lovely. You guys can print these off, you can put them wherever you want, you can fill up your house with all of this stuff. And this is basically all yours. So all of this stuff is all yours for you to use whenever you want. Um, if I go back, if I can remember how to go back to my snap device, see if I can do it. Oh no, I think I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> um, if I go back to my courses, there you go. Um, go back, go back. Where was I? Maybe if I can carry on going back. I can't remember if I can go back. Um, but basically what you can do is it will tell you when all of the webinars are as well. Or maybe the home, that'd be sensible, wouldn't it? You'd think that I would know how to use this better. Um, what I can basically do is I can look at what sort of seminars are going on. I can look at, if I go on my courses, if I go on biology again, um, I'm pretty sure it tells you at the top, there you go, here are the web classes. So apparently my web class might be somewhere over here or here are my ones in the future, right? So here is a web class about DNA and RNA, which I'm doing at some point next week. Um, there'll be a whole other list of the other ones that I'm doing. So essentially what we've got guys is we've got 
uh, all of the course stuff for you to do. So all of these exam questions and look, here's your weekly progress. If you want an A star, apparently you need to get 400. Uh, oh, my pen battery is low. Um, but look, and then finally, the last thing, you've got a drop in tutor as well. If you sign up to our premium service, there I am talking to you from somewhere in London. Um, yeah, this is basically what we're offering you. So you've got our web classes where every week I'll be sat around by my computer. You can ask me questions. I'll have a go at getting back to you. And essentially, that's what uh, Snap Provise is going to be, or it currently is. So if you haven't signed up, I fully recommend you signing up. Um, loads of you are asking about how much this is going to cost as well. Look, um, here are the prices, just so you know, for those of you that were asking me ages ago, and I couldn't tell you because I didn't actually know this just yet. Um, the basic one is £9.99 a month. Um, for that, you get all of the videos which have gone through, all of the exam videos that I've shown you a second ago and the mini revision guides. The slightly more expensive one uh, is the pro one. So this is per month. You get all of the same things, but you get the self-marking quizzes as well. So the quizzes, which you just saw me showing you a second ago, uh, you'll get them. You'll get the smart adaptive learning stuff. So all of the videos that came up a second ago, I didn't actually mention it. They came up based on what I didn't know. So I got more videos because I didn't know certain things. Um, and then your exam packs with thousands of questions. And then the absolute amazing one, and I know some of you are going to see this as £49.99 a month is pretty expensive. Um, it, it is expensive, I agree, and I understand. But the comparison that we are trying to beat is we're trying to we're trying to beat your like the tutors in your area who are charging that much just for like one session. When I used to be a tutor for um, GCSE, I was charging like £35 just to do GCSE. For A-level, I've known people to charge way above that. Um, and this is for the whole month, so as many videos as you can watch. But with that, you get all of the web classes, um, which is this that you've seen today, the live ones, and you get a drop-in tutor, you have a tutor support chat where I can answer your questions with videos. And yeah, that, that's basically what we're offering you. That's a young Ollie. Who said that's a young Ollie? That was me like six months ago, or like less than that, three months ago. I think I'm just tired. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> but anyway... Guys, so final final week, this is the final week of the free web classes. So for all of you lovely people who have like um, messaged me, like people I've got to know over the last few weeks, this is the last week. So this is the last time you'll be able to talk to me unless you sign up. And I know that's really sad, but please do at the very least watch our chemistry ones um, just so you can keep, keep up with, uh, I don't know, Georgia and myself. Um, but otherwise, otherwise we're coming to the end. So this is the discount code for today, BTC10, which expires at midnight, will give you £10 off, apparently, um, for your first month. So you can use that on any one of the courses. So you can use it on the Ultimate, the Pro, and the Basic Package. And finally, by the end of today, hopefully you guys know how we can test molecules uh, qualitatively. So with Benedict's um, the lipid test, the iodine, Biorets. Hopefully you know how to test for sugars quantitatively using colorimetry and hopefully you know how to plot a calibration curve where you have your uh, known concentrations against absorbances, you take your sample and then you plot it against a graph, you follow along the curve and then you have your answer. Okay, um, lovely. Guys, that is the end. If you have any questions for me, I'll sit around for a few minutes and have a go answering your questions. But otherwise, this is the end. And I will go in a bit. <laughs> do we have a live webcam for physics yet? I don't know if we do physics. I think we have someone on their way, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure someone will be able to answer that way. Guys, don't be sad. What's the code again? Bam, BT10. Oh, and don't forget as well, that Instagram thing I meant, the, inst the which I meant to say, the Instagram thing, if you um, tag us and like follow us, Basically, we'll give one of you Snap Revise 2.0. We'll give you like the top service, by the way. Okay, so if you want to get a free, um, this stuff for free, the 40 pound or 49, whatever it was, for free, guys, make sure you tag us on Instagram. It's a very easy way. I once won a few festival tickets that way, which is pretty cool. Um, any questions? Give you 30 more seconds, because I can't tell you much about math syllabuses. Syllabi? Thanks for sessions. I'm really glad, Georgine, that they've been helpful. I'm genuinely really thrilled that you found it helpful. Equally, Fatima, you have been amazing. Um, tag you in a story or uh, I think just in a post. I wouldn't go for a story. I'd go for just a post so that we can find it. Right, lovely, guys. I'm going to go in that case. So I hope you have a really, really lovely rest of your evening. Um, if you do want to 
like join us at any point then i'll see you again um but otherwise best of luck with your a levels if you don't join please join then you can carry on with these and that'd be really nice um good luck with your a levels hopefully i'll see you again next time but for now um yeah see you later guys <laughs>